Hey folks, it's Jeff and uh, welcome to the Daily Evolver. It's Thursday, October 12th, 2017. And I don't know about you, but I'm just a little tired of politics. And uh, so today I'd like to do something a little different. And that is uh, review a movie that um, I think uh, you would like to see. Uh, I, I certainly did. And, uh, and it's at the end of its first run. So uh, it's, it's going to be going away in the next couple of weeks. And it's the movie, Dun the movie Dunkirk. And I loved this movie. I was bodily thrilled by this movie. I still feel, when I think about it, a, 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 an enlargement, you know, an updraft. Uh, and I would nominate it for a candidate for consideration for being integral art. And one of the things that's so fabulous about having an evolutionary view is that you always know that something new is coming online. And something that is uh, not only new, but can't be predicted. And it's, um, and we know it when we see it. And, and of, course, of course, art often leads the way in new cultural transformations. It certainly has a very important transformational and uh, translational aspect to reality that helps us understand who we are and where we're at. And this movie does that. And, and, and I'm going to give you a subjective criteria for why I think that's true. And that is because it made me feel something that felt new. And I'll explain that as we go along. Uh, but I could also give sort of a technical uh, explanation from an integral point of view. And that is that this movie, Dunkirk, integrates a traditional story, a traditional story of heroism, and tells it in a postmodern voice. So it is both cool in the postmodern way, and yet dripping with meaning in the way of great stories of heroism of all time that are meant not to entertain, certainly to entertain too, but to instruct and to transmit something to the audience. And so that is my you know, quick and dirty argument for it being integral. And um, uh, let me just say that I'm not alone in my admiration for this movie. Uh, although I have my own argument for why, uh, it's a very significant film, uh, very, very uh, highly critically acclaimed already. It was released just over three months ago. It has a Rotten Tomatoes rating of 93, and many of them are raves from some of the biggest, uh, most respected movie critics in the world. And what's also interesting is that it is a big popular success and has made over half a billion dollars already, probably I, I, that's a statistic from a couple of weeks ago. So it's probably gone over a billion. And, um, and has been a success in uh, all, many countries, which is not typical for movies that are about a particular incident in a particular country's history. So it's an interesting movie in that it has hit a nerve. Now, it's made by a, a filmmaker who is famous already, of course, Christopher Nolan who is a Brit, and he has done a series of movies that uh, I never loved them. The first three that are of, of you know, general note are Inception, Memento, and then the Dark Knight series of the uh, Batman. And I always found them to be kind of too cool and too deconstructive in that postmodern way, which I'll get to in a second, uh, except for... Um, uh, Heath Ledger is the Joker. That, <laughs> that was uh, a jolt. Uh, what, what an amazing performance. What is it about actors who can transmit that through the screen? It's just a, it's a level of genius that is um, uh, just a spike in somebody's, you know, psychogram. Anyway, uh, in Interstellar, which is a movie from a few years ago, he sort of flirted with meaning at the end, and it left me wanting so much more because I do love his filmmaking. And, you know, he's playing with a little bit of the sort of deep structures of the universe and maybe an, an intelligence and even a loving intelligence that's behind the reality. Uh, but, you know, still very cool. <laughs> and, uh, and Dunkirk is different. In Dunkirk, he dives right in. 
and um, and goes for a story that where the meaning is already pre-installed, and he doesn't try to deconstruct it. Uh, so let me just tell a little bit of the story of Dunkirk itself, in case you have been living in a cave. Uh, Dunkirk is, is the, the movie Dunkirk is about the Battle of Dunkirk, which was a battle in World War II early on in the war, when the Germans had blitzed across Europe and cornered the British and French forces, mostly British, in this little town of Dunkirk um, up in northwest uh, France. And there were 400,000 troops up there who were cornered by the, um, by the Germans. And um, what was so agonizing about that is that they were a mere 80 miles from home. Uh, you know, Britain was just over the, the English Channel, but you know, they couldn't get there. The boats, uh, they didn't have enough warships. And, and so they were sitting ducks. And although there's a lot of historical controversy over why the Germans just didn't go, just didn't go in and crush them, and it's seen as a mistake by the Germans, uh, the, the Germans were at the same time strafing these men who were just sitting ducks out on this beach, 400,000 of them, and 70,000 did die. Uh, but out of Britain arose this great rescue uh, driven by just regular people. And so it was this flotilla of boats, uh, dinghies, fishing boats, pleasure boats, lifeboats, whatever people had, but, but piloted by civilians, 800 of them, who start steaming across the English Channel and ferry these um, soldiers back to safety. And they, they, they did indeed ferry 330,000 of them back to safety. And uh, so of course this has become one of the great legends uh, already of, 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 of British history and it's taught and known by every uh, you know, school child in the country. And it's such a historic story and uh, I'm sorry, a heroic story, and, 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 and indeed literally thousands of individual heroic stories. I mean, the magnitude of it just stretches the heart and imagination. And all of these stories are worthy of whatever glory that history wants to bestow on them. And that's just true. But Christopher Nolan actually doesn't tell really any of these stories, at least not in the way that we expect stories to be told. There's no context. Uh, we find ourselves just suddenly uh, joined with this little troop of, uh, of uh, uh, retreating British infantrymen. They're, they're just regular soldiers. And they run out with us at the camera onto the beach and there it all unfolds from there. There's no backstory. There's no context. We know nothing about the, who's fighting who. There's none of these scenes of the generals pouring over the maps or the you know, politicians arguing in the, in the parliament. Uh, we're just there. And the infantrymen actually have no backstories either. There's no stock characters like you know, the plucky one, the bully, the lover boy, the you know, nerd, the coward. Uh, and, and in fact, when I think back on it, they even looked alike. They all just look like young British guys between the ages of 18 and 22. Uh, you sort of you think Harry Styles from the boy band One Direction, if you know who that is. And I actually found out after the movie that Harry Styles was one of the stars, <laughs> if you could call it that. They didn't have they didn't star in a normal way. But he was one of the leads, and, um, and I actually had a little bit of a hard time remembering which one he was. So, you know, saving Private Ryan, the saint. There's a cool detachment, uh, and oddly, it strengthens the movie. And I'll explain that. So first of all, just a, a brief... Um, uh, sort of recap of the postmodern worldview, and I know I talk about this a lot because the postmodern worldview is the worldview of the leading edge of culture in the developed world. It's the liberals that came online really out of the ashes of the first half of the 20th century, which was seen rightly as a series of conflagrations of tens of millions of people killed in the First World War and these various uh, 
pogroms and, and of course, the Second World War. And what postmodernity does, uh, and it really gained a cultural coherence in the 60s. We think of it as the 60s. It rejects all of the grand narratives of history. All the grand narratives of, you know, my tribe at the tribal stage or my clan or creed at the red stage, at the warrior stage, uh, my nation, my religion, my race at the traditional stage, that we are the best and we are destined to be ascendant and we are the children of God, the chosen ones of God. And you know, modern, modernity rejected uh, the, the mythic aspects of that when modernity or, or the orange meme came online uh, 300 years or so ago. But even the Enlightenment people, the people who came to bring science and logic and rationality uh, and, and their promise and our belief, everybody's belief that, it, that rationality would save us from our savagery. Uh, but what we realized after World War II was that instead, it mechanized our savagery and ended up in concentration camps, which were factories, you know, sophisticated factories with modern logistics, uh, except, uh, you know, the product was corpses. And uh, the atomic bomb, you know, where, uh, you know, would, a, a weapon that would kill tens of thousands of people at a stroke. And so there's a great demoralization and, and self-flagellation uh, and, and even a, a sort of a self-hatred that we of humanity that we feel still in the green postmodern world. Now, it's worth noting that in actual numbers, the 20th century is the most peaceful century in recorded history. Uh, up to the 21st, which is far more peaceful. But in terms of percentages of people who were killed by violence, the 20th century was less, uh, a smaller percentage than the 19th, 18th, 17th. And that just shows you what a cauldron <laughs> uh, human history is, you know. So anyway, Integral notice, notices that fact because we, you know, have the information and see the sort of movement of history there. But postmodernity doesn't. And postmodernity uh, basically comes up with the idea that, you know, forget all these grand narratives about who's right and who's wrong and who's more noble and whose women are more beautiful and who has the greater God and, who, you know, and uh, forget all of that horseshit. Actually, what history is, is a series of who can dominate and who can, who can be oppressed by who. And that deconstructs all of these previous stories. Again, the currency here is just basically brute force. And that's what matters, who can oppress who. So the postmodern aesthetic, and we can see this on all postmodern art forms, um, uh, literature and movies and, 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 and fine art, they reject meaning in favor of just experience, you know? And so thus, in this way, uh, you know, it is a postmodern movie. It's a movie with no bad guys. There's absolutely zero effort to establish any moral superiority of our side against their side. Uh, we never see a German face. We know nothing about their predicament. Uh, I think that in, in terms of, I remember learning in high school English class this principle that all literature is divided into three, could, can be divided into three categories. Man versus man, use a sexist language, but here we go. Man versus man, man versus himself, or man versus nature. And it's sort of a, an implacable third person snowstorm or avalanche or tsunami or whatever it is. And in that, using those categories, Dunkirk is actually more in the third category. The enemy is not evil, He's just implacable, implacable and relentless and random and impersonal. And you don't see any of war, the war porn that is so typical of war movies these days where we have, you know, blood and guts down so well. But, you know, there's, you, you, there's no doubt that what's going on is hell. War is hell here too. 
but you don't see that sort of visceral, shocking, uh, upsetting, you know, war porn. That uh, so I appreciated that um, aesthetic uh, judgment on Nolan's part. So visually cool in a way, if you can imagine a war mov movie being that way, but very sonically hot. And I have never heard anything like the soundtrack to this movie. I mean, I was shocked by it and moved. And what an amazing and courageous, um, I don't know courageous, but ballsy decision to write the soundtrack the way it was. And it, it's done by a, 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 a celebrated uh, movie uh, composer, Hans, Hans Zimmer who wrote Elysium, if uh, any of you know that, it became kind of popular. And it's one of my favorite soundtracks and it's very quiet and pretty and ethereal and sort of science fiction in a sweet way. Um, this is the exact polar opposite of Elysium. This is a blaring amalgam of, you know, the sounds of war, of the sounds of what's actually going on. So bombs exploding, sirens wailing, heavy equipment clanging, the roar of the ocean, heartbeats gasping, uh, breath, death. There's no, there's nothing to hum in the shower after this movie, if you know what I mean. There's no little themes or anything like that. But this is that postmodern aesthetic. It's just taken to an extreme, a crazy extreme, where you're walloping the viewer in uh, an immersive, visceral experience. Again, experience uh, is privileged over understanding in postmodernity. There's nothing to understand. There's no meaning to anything in postmodernity. It's just this life arising. And, and, and so the audience definitely is made to feel as if they've experienced this battle. Um, in our theater, unfortunately, I saw it at the IMAX in, uh, in Denver, uh, it was so loud that we had, I, I was holding my ears. I mean, I, I thought it was a public health hazard, actually. Uh, but I can't wait to hear it again uh, at, at a slightly more appropriate level. So another aspect of the movie that's more postmodern. So we're talking about, just to recap, we're talking about it. Re, uh, th this rejects meaning in favor of experience. Visually hot, sonically cool. I'm sorry, visually cool, sonically hot. And then third, it, it has the, um, well, how it arises is you can't understand the goddamn thing they're saying. Very much. I mean, I got maybe a third of the dialogue. And this is so typical of postmodern art, which is, you know, anti-intellectual, again, anti-idea. It's don't get so hung up on the words and the ideas. Just sit back and let it wash over you. <laughs> and Christopher Nolan's the worst in all of his movies. I will never watch another one of his movies without one of those little um, closed caption devices. Because, you know, you wrote a screenplay, dude. <laughs> That's a big thing. I want to know what's in it. So anyway, that's a critique, I guess. Uh, another aspect of, the, of, of sort of the postmodern aesthetic, and this is very typical of Nolan, is that t the time of the movie, the unspooling of the movie, is all deconstructed. And it happens on three timelines. There's the week on the beach. There's one day in the boat a boat coming over of a man and his son and his son's friend. Uh, and, and it's played by Mark Rylance, who, if there's an actor who can transmit sort of quiet dignity, I'd want to know who it is. So what a beautiful casting, beautiful casting all around. Um, and then, so there's the week at the beach, the day in the boat, and an hour of a dog fight in the sky with a pilot. And, and then all three of these, a uh, British pilot fighting a, a German. And all of these timelines converge at the end. So what we end up with then is, and this is the postmodern uh, aesthetic, and it's often referred to as surface without depth. Surface without depth. So we're seeing the play of life from a meditative, from a meditator's uh, perspective, it actually uh, represents a realization of, of that life is unfolding 
under its own power. And we as a meditator, as long as we don't have any preference from one thing over the other, just keep coming back to our breath and watch what's happening, we can watch this unfolding without um, adding any meaning, basically. And so postmodern art sort of gets us there. There's a certain liberation from the personal that can be quite beautiful. Postmodern art is my favorite kind of art. And I think of some of the great exemplars of postmodern art. One is Cirque du Soleil. I just, you know, there's, again, we don't know the performers. We don't know their backstories. There's no story being told. They don't grow. They don't, nothing moves. But there's just this display of life. Everything's moving in a display. And there's, uh, you know, even if uh, a performer does something that's just awesome and the audience just has to clap and go, oh, my God, then we, our attention is distracted to something else. We're not even allowed that sort of feeling of, oh, my God, and we're on to the next thing. And, and there's, that's a beautiful, it's, it's just overwhelming in a way that really does take us beyond thought. And that's a good thing. I think of a couple movies in that category. One is Moulin Rouge. Uh, which is just this wild ride of sensuality. It's just, uh, I've, again, never seen a movie quite like that. Uh, on sort of the ugly side of the street, we see Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, which <laughs> one of my all-time favorite movies. Al, uh, forgetting uh, Al, Alec Baldwin, and uh, he's just a great cast. Uh, but it's all about this deranged obsession with real estate leads at a real estate office. I mean, and that's all, that, that's just that. And, you know, you can even see it in popular art. And, uh, of course, the great postmodern uh, example of postmodern uh, television is Seinfeld, where, you know, what's their slogan? No hugging, no learning. You know, w nobody's going anywhere here. It's just this, this display of the peccadilloes of these self-involved people that becomes hilarious because we see that that same thing's going on in us. And that's art, it's what art does. So the postmodern art, I'm not dissing it, it's the greatest, uh, except for integral art, which takes the best of the postmodern aesthetic and integrates it into a new thing. And so that's what this movie does. And, and so how is this movie integral? I just talked about how it's postmodern. And the most important creative decision of this movie is that he chose to make it about the Battle of Dunkirk. And again, for this event, the meaning is pre-installed. Uh, you, you can't see this without uh, getting the transmission of heroism if you tried. And he doesn't try. He does not try, try to deconstruct that. Uh, he could have done uh, something that he does very well, a science fiction movie. Uh, where it uh, you know, would have been the same kind of cool, detached kind of voice. And he could have told of some intergalactic war where anonymous soldiers were rescued by uh, nameless rescuers. And it might have been spectacular, and the soundtrack may have been by Hans Zimmer, but it would have been meaningless and boring, which is a lot of my sort of critique of early Christopher Nolan movies. Uh, but... This is where, God bless him, he, he, he not only uh, chose that, this, this story that's dripping with meaning, uh, but he didn't try to deconstruct it at all. You know, there's none of what uh, a green war movies do, like Apocalypse Now, Thin Red Line, uh, even think of television MASH in literature, Catch-22 where they just show the random, absurd horror, uh, you know, young men and women sacrificed and, you know, war porn and all of it as, as, as a means of transmitting to the viewer the, just the horror of war. And that's great. It does its thing. And so, but that's not what Nolan's doing here. You know, he's not anti-sentimental like a Green would be. Uh, and this, again, is gets into integral territory because he wants us to feel deeply uh, in three or four cases it wrecked me the the nobility of these characters again of mark rylance and i mean it just moves me right now to think of the scene on the boat and i won't 
uh, say what it was, except to say that um, the depth of humanity was just, you know, doing to me now what it's doing, you know, three weeks later. Um, a, a fateful decision by the pilot, who's played by Tom Hardy, <sighs> dreamboat, although his face is covered with an oxygen mask, but still those eyes. Uh, and then also Churchill, Winston Churchill, the prime minister, and delivering his immortal speech on the occasion of this rescue. And it's the famous speech where he says, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. Wow, you know. And we hear that over a static radio where, of course, you can't make out the goddamn thing he's saying, but most people know it. That's the point. Uh, so that, that, th that is not green. That's not postmodern anymore. That's something new. So this, this appreciation of the heroism without aggrandizing it or demeaning it, either one. And then uh, another choice that I think, I, I didn't really think at first, but I do now, is that he chose to do this with a bare minimum of con computer-generated graphics. So, um, you know, and at first I felt disappointed. I remember my friends and I walked out of the theater and I thought, did he just do um, the typical sort of postmodern thing of punifying this amazing battle by, you know, not showing actually 400,000 men? or uh, 800 boats, because we never got those sweeping scenes of the first you see one boat and then you pan out, you see 20 more and then three, and then all the hundreds more and then, oh my God, and you pan across the beach and you see uh, you know, a group of soldiers and then a couple hundred and then, oh my God, thousands, hundreds of thousands. And so we didn't get that blast. We didn't get that sense of scale. And, and again, of context, but that's not what he chose to do. What he did choose to do was pull together the greatest, in terms of, 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 of actual numbers of, of extras, which was 3,000, and 60 real boats, the vast majority of them authentic World War II boats. And he actually, this is one of the biggest movie productions of all time. And he used them. And it had plenty of scale but what it also had, and this is where I think it goes into something more than this sort of uh, postmodern con computer generated visceral wallop of scale, it, 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 it achieved a first similitude, or if I pronounce that right, but uh, just an appreciation of the extra X factor that is delivered, the depth actually that is delivered when cinema is made out of images of actual people and actual things. Yay, Christopher Nolan. So again, it feels like something new. And again, technically, if we want to look at it, it's, it's this traditional story of heroism told in a postmodern way, which is an integration. You know, and then there's something new that arises out of that and it transcends into a new artistic expression of the human condition, where, again, our nobility is recognized. And it's not demeaned, it's not uh, aggrandized, there's no extra meaning added to it, uh, but it's liberated in that way into the realization that it's still there and available to us individually and collectively. And that we have a responsibility to know it and to act on it. And in that way, the particular becomes the universal. And, and, and so Dunkirk actually ends up doing what all of human stories have done throughout history, but except for post-modernity, which will do anything but this. And that is it focuses on the growth, not necessarily of the characters, but that's the green part, but it indeed is intended to cultivate the growth of the audience. And I'm so grateful for that. And as I said, I feel like a slart, slightly larger person for having seen it. And that feeling has stayed with me for the weeks since.
So in that way, I think Dunkirk represents uh, a movement that is about the evolution of art, the evolution of the aesthetic line of development in humanity and about the evolution of humanity itself, which is, uh, again, a beautiful choice. It's sealed in the last line of Churchill's speech uh, where he says this, he says, and this is Churchill, we will carry on the struggle until in God's good time, the new world with all its power and might steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. You know, who knew that old Winston was an evolutionary? But let me read that again. It's worthwhile. We will carry on the struggle until in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. And that is the story of Dunkirk. Winston Churchill was right. And that is the story of our life here on earth. And, uh, and it's very meaningful. So I encourage you to see Dunkirk this weekend before it goes away. Uh, or uh, make sure you do get to see it. And of course, it'll be here for all of our big fancy TVs soon too. So, and that I think it'll translate just fine. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, Corey, any thoughts? Yeah, um, great review, Jeff. Awesome Thank review. You. I haven't actually seen Dunkirk yet. Um, I have to say though, when you were when you were going through Nolan's catalog, I was a little sad you didn't mention The Prestige. I'm not sure I've seen it. No, oh, that hmm. was that was my favorite Nolan movie. I think hmm. it, had, uh, it was the movie about magicians, and uh, hmm. David Bowie plays Nikolai Tesla, and it's sublime. It's absolutely oh, sublime. Yeah. fabulous. Um, I'll check it out. The Prestige. Yeah, the Prestige. I, I hope I'm getting that right. Um, yeah, well, you know, one of the things that, that came up for me, Jeff, is that as you were talking about this, it occurred to me the difference between what I'll call the, the enactment of integral art versus the integral enactment of art, right? And integral art is a really, really difficult topic to talk about because there's no hard and fast definitions, just like there's no real hard and fast definitions of postmodern art. We can see certain patterns, we can see, you know, certain tendencies, um, but there's, there's, you know, really no qualification for what makes something pre-modern, modern or postmodern. Um, other than, you know, just, it's, it's kind of like porn, you know it when you see it, right? But that knowing sort of requires the capacity to enact it in a particular way, to enact it in an integral way. So an integral mind looking at an artifact that was created by an, an, another integral mind is probably going to see some details and some patterns and some substance to it that might be lost on people who haven't quite cultivated that perspective yet. And it's interesting because it, it, it works in the opposite way too. You know, I noticed, for example, with my generation, Gen X, we're a very critical generation. You and are. We're, I mean, you know, this is what... <laughs> This is what happens when, you know, the generation before us gets a sexual revolution and the generation after really fun. internet porn. You would, you would have loved it. And we get, you know, eight. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's hard not to be cynical yeah. and critical as a Gen Xer. Um, but, you know, sometimes that, 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 that critical nature rubs against me the wrong way because I don't, that's not really you know, my predisposition, um, you know, for me. Well, it's very postmodern. I mean, postmodernity post is very critical. I mean, it, it, there's nothing, they're not building anything. They're yeah. deconstructing and that's fine. That's actually right on schedule. We need to de deconstruct these, you know, romantic horseshit stories that lead us all to, you know, conflagration. That's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there's something about the postmodern idea, or I should say, the identity that forms within the postmodern space where, you know, I remember when I was a teenager, you know, a Gen X teenager, I am so defined by, for example, my music collection, right? Like you come into my house, you look at my CD stacks, and I have a sense that you, you, you know something about me, something that yeah. I, I would have a hard time communicating with you. But what's interesting also is you're also almost as much, if not more defined 
by the CDs you don't have, right? You're, you're, you're as defined by what you hate as you are by what you love. And I, I can't remember who said it. Uh, it might have been Patton Oswalt or some, someone like that. But they're like, you know, when I hit 40 years old, I just realized I didn't have the time or energy to hate music anymore, to hate bands, right? <laughs> and to me, that's, yeah. that's sort of, that's sort of Progress. what the integral feels like. Yes. Because you're, 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 you know, it's kind of like 15 years ago when, I, when my obsession with music and making mixtapes led me towards becoming a DJ. But I didn't want to be just any DJ. I wanted to be the integral DJ who only played integral music, right? right. Well, as soon as I bought those five albums in existence that re- that represent, you know, once I bought all of Saul Williams and Stuart Davis's catalogs, mm-hmm. I was, I'm kind of running out of options here. So yep. I sort of popped into a different understanding, which is an integral appreciation of music, yep. where all music, in a sense, becomes integral because I'm enacting it in an integral totally. way. It didn't arise out of nothing. Yeah, that's you know, right. It's an expression of humanity that's in right. some time or place. And yes, hallelujah. I want to know what that is. Yeah, I want exactly. to feel it. Yeah, and, and, and it's almost like Integral gives you the capacity to, you know, not just sort of locate it, but by locating it, you're actually able to liberate more beauty out of it. You're able to yeah. liberate more, you know, more meaning, more... I always think of something Leonard Bernstein said, the, you know, great composer and, and conductor of the New York Philharmonic. He said, I like all kinds of music, except Hawaiian. <laughs> 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 Actually, I love Hawaii too, but uh, go, go on. I'm sorry. Well, I, I, I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure if I have a, a strong point that I'm trying to arrive at. But, but no, that's true. I mean, there's, there's art that you could say that's a work of, of integral art and in that it integrates and is doing something new by uh, not being limited by the aesthetic of these previous stages somehow. And it's integrating yeah. these previous stages. So that's one thing. And that's what I'm arguing for Dunkirk. Right. And then there's the integral appreciation of art where you actually just basically appreciate every, there's what art would you not appreciate? That's right. That's you right. Know? You know, and, I, and I think, for example, um, Eminem's recent performance, right? Criticizing. Oh my God. Which, if Fantastic. You seen it was freaking amazing. It's on now, YouTube. I don't make, I'm not going to make the claim that Eminem is an integral artist. I don't. I don't I resonate kind of would. with Eminem in those lines. He's a candidate for me, I gotta say. Well, but, but here's the thing. I think Eminem is very easy to enact from an integral point of view. I think that, you know, he's, he's certainly playing with certain things. I don't, I, I don't know if he, you know, maybe he does. I don't know. I, don't, right. I, I personally don't think he has the cognitive capacity to sort of hang out at those altitudes. But when I watch that video and I'm able to see, you know, I'm able to see things that you don't necessarily see from a postmodern view. I'm able to see the, the physical transmission of his... His, Unbelievable! You know, the, the breathing and the pacing. I'm able to see no, it's, the emotional it's, transmission, yeah, the it's, passion, and you it's know, poetry in motion. That's right. And the intellect is. I mean, his his lyricism is. I mean, you have to actually read his. You know, razor spirit, sharp. Three, four, five times over in order to get sort of all the layers of meaning that he's packing yep. into it. Um, and and to me, you know, as sort of you know, someone who on a good day is an integral dude. I can look at that performance and it, it, it explodes for me. It resonates with me. Yeah. It lights up my own integral consciousness yes. in a way that if I was just having a conversation with Eminem, might not get lit up quite in yeah. the same way. Yeah. And that's, that's the power of art. Hallelujah. And, and it's, you know, it's, it, it's also, it's a difficult thing to talk about too, because art is by its very nature so subjective. So another integral person could be listening to this talk and, you know, they're just as integral as anyone, as anyone else, whatever that means. And maybe they didn't like Dunkirk. And that's, that's what's interesting about no. this conversation. Well, you know, it's possible. No, I'm just, right? of course it's possible. I mean, there's integralists out there who, you know, are praiseworthy of Trump. And that's okay yeah. because these, these views get, you know, basically each of our views is, is enacted differently. There are as many integral views as there are cosmic addresses in the integral neighborhood. Yep. And we're all using the same methodology. We're all using a similar lens, but we're adding to that lens our accumulated wisdom and virtue and life experience and biases and all of that, which is going to cause us to enact this world in very different ways. And that's, that's... Sort of where the fun is, because I get to look at how is Jeff enacting this artifact? How am I enacting this artifact? What is Jeff seeing that I'm not seeing? What am I seeing that he's not seeing? Right. And, and it actually deepens your appreciation. And again, it yeah. liberates these things totally. by locating it in a certain yes. way. Yes. Hallelujah. Well said. 
It's beautiful. So if anyone who's listening right now has any opinions about Dunkirk, please raise your hand. Please stand up. Please stand up. <laughs> All right. Looks we like, all do. Uh, we'll have to do a, an episode on M and M. Oh, I would love to. I would yeah. love to. I mean, I would love to do a, a, an episode just about an integral appreciation of hop, of hip hop. Yeah. In general. Me too. It's, it's, Me too. It's right. Yeah. It's it's right. A lot I have to learn there. Yeah. Okay, my friend. Okay, my friends. That's it for this week. So uh, again, Monday through Thursday next week. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Corey and the gang at Integral Life for producing this and for Integral Live, L-I-V-E in general, which is your live TV show. And what's coming up that we might pay attention to? Yeah, well, we got a few things coming up. So, well, next week we've got a whole new week of Daily Evolver episodes, Monday through Friday, same bad Mon- time. Monday through Thursday. Oh, I'm sorry. Monday yep. through Thursday. Yes, indeed. Got a little ahead of myself there. Yeah. Um, and you know, people should tune in particularly on for Thursday's episode. We're going to be, uh, Jeff and I are going to be doing a conversation with our friend Ryan Olkey from Power Up Productions. And we're going to be getting into the topic of cryptocurrency, blockchain, uh, as a massively disruptive force. Um, the, you know, potential opportunities that, um, cryptocurrency and blockchain are, are presenting for the world. And uh, I'm really excited for that discussion. And then the following week, um, we're going to talk to uh, Miriam Mason Martineau about the art of integral parenting. Parenting is a spiritual practice. I'm greatly looking forward to that. She is uh, just radiant. And um, other than that, uh, let's see, we've got a Ken Wilber webinar coming up on, I think it's the 28th, Saturday, the 28th. Let me look at my calendar real quickly. Yes, Saturday, the 28th. Uh, you'll hear more about that tomorrow. We're going to send out a big mailing to everyone with Ken's invitation to the uh, What Now event at the end of the year. And uh, I hope everyone can stay tuned for that. Ken is, has been absolutely on fire lately. Uh, and then looking a bit further, uh, Keith Witt is going to continue doing his uh, Live with Dr. Keith broadcasts the first Saturday of every month. And the next one will be on Saturday 4th. Uh, I'm sorry, November the 4th. I'm having a hard time talking today. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's our schedule for the next few weeks. I think you're talking real good. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> well, cool. It's a lot happening in integral life, actually. And, um, and in the integral world. You know, it's, it's frothy. It's chaotic. It's fun. Uh, it's, you know, uh, and, and integral life uh, sort of... Uh, uh, transmits it better than anyone and is it really at the center of the scene so i encourage you to join integral life and uh become a member and uh and support it so thank you thank you jeff